All right. Today I have with me Dr. Vera Glusevic. She is a professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Southern California. Dr. Glusevic, welcome to Race Cogatons. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. So this is an exciting episode because so far I've been interviewing mostly uh, people in the behavioral scientists, uh, in the behavioral sciences, uh, neuroscientists, psychologists, biologists. Uh, so this is more like race extensa than race cogitons, talking about the physical world rather than the mind. So most of my audience is more familiar with the behavioral sciences, I would imagine, than the physical sciences. So before we, we dive into your background and the details, I'd like to ask you to, to, to kind of overview what you do as an astrophysicist and what's interesting about it to people who don't have too much of a hard science background. That's a good question. So um, what I do is a branch of physics and astrophysics that we call cosmology, which is a study of the universe, of the physical universe as a whole, using the tools of physics. Um, and so I'll immediately answer some of your coming questions to try to answer this first one, which is that the reason I do this is because I wanted to study all of it, right? And mm -hmm. this is also the reason why people are often so fascinated by cosmology. It's the study of the entire physical world. Um, yeah. So that's kind of a, in short, what I do. Yeah, it, it is a great topic. And th there's something about it that seems to attract a lot more public interest. Like, for example, I don't have too much of a physics background, but I, I'm really excited for this conversation. But I, it would be a lot harder for me to imagine uh, interviewing someone about like solid state physics or all of these much more technical things. But it seems like everyone can kind of connect to wanting to know more about the universe. That's absolutely, absolutely true. And, and this is, you know, the reason is obvious. You can walk out in the evening and look up at the night sky and, you know, marvel at, at it all. And, and this is pretty much how a lot of us who do astrophysics have started, right? When I was a kid, um, I used to look up at the night sky and just like feel this like incredible feeling of comfort and like awe and, you know, the beauty of the, of the universe and how big, just how big it is and how small we are. Um, and I think a lot of people relate to that. And some mm -hmm. of us decide to embark on, on the mathematical journey that, that gets you to actually study it in detail. Yeah. So how early did you make that connection to that feeling of awe and, and connecting it to math and physics and deciding that's what you want to do? Yeah. So I like to tell a story that maybe sounds a little um, like an unconventional beginning, but I like it because it's it's kind of wacky and weird. Um, when I was very little, um, I grew up in, in Serbia, um, so Eastern Europe, and um, I was watching TV and I saw this movie that I, for the life of me, cannot track <laughs> to, to present day. I never was able to find it again. It was a slow budget uh, movie about a woman astrophysicist who saved the world from a, uh, you know, incoming comet or asteroid or something like that. And she was super smart and like super beautiful. Um, and she just was like this fantastic role model that just got ingrained into my mind. And I thought, you know, this was the first time I heard a word astrophysicist. And I thought, this is so cool. I want to be like her, right? So this is where, you know, the, the uh, role models that we see really, really all early on in the childhood really like leave an imprint. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, that's how it all started. Were you also into sci-fi as a kid? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think I only read when I was a kid. Uh, I always found it really hard to read novels about people's lives and things like that. But I really, really enjoyed reading sci-fi that talks about other worlds and like these wonderful ideas of, you know, how the universe might possibly be working, um, you know, aliens and things like that. Absolutely. I enjoy that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it seems like it, it was ingrained in you from the beginning. So how, how did you decide to study physics in college? Is it just, was it a very natural progression? Cause I, like, I don't think I knew what physics was until I took it in high school. So, um, I'm not sure uh, if, if that was a different story for you, if you knew, knew about it uh, earlier on. Yeah. Yeah. So for um, in Serbia, the time I was growing up there, uh, you kind of choose a major before you enroll college. So it's not liberal arts uh, schooling system that we have in the U S 
um, it's something totally different. So in, in high school, I had to decide what I wanted to do. Um, and I wanted to do paleontology and astrophysics and linguistics. <laughs> and then I very quickly realized that I can do um, linguistics or I can study languages and learn about languages maybe in my free time, but physics I really need to dig into because it's a, it's a lot of work to, um, to learn about all the things we already know and then try to build on that. So I decided to go uh, with astrophysics and Serbia didn't have a good paleontology department. So that was an easy choice. This is how I decided. But I had to decide very, very early on. Yeah, those sound those sound like so different fields. But this this is a pretty new new show. You're you're the the seventh episode I'm recording, and I've also had a linguist, and I've had uh, an evolutionary biologist, which was kind of close to paleontology. So so we we have similar wide ranging interests. So yeah, and so in college, you were studying physics, or or even before then, I guess in high school, you you settled on this. Um, were you involved? When did you get involved in research? Um, so I learned from um, my colleagues uh, in in college, from my um, well, upper classmates, uh, that you know usually if you want to um, study astrophysics, most people at that time used to do summer schools, and I think this is still true, um, either summer schools or summer research internships, and so on. So I. Basically, I spent one month looking up, you know, summer research opportunities in the US um, and I found a whole bunch, applied, I got in, I went to um, the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore uh, as a summer intern and then I got my recommendations from the people working there and that's kind of how the, the path uh, towards the graduate school here in the US started for me. Yeah, that's great. And we're did you know you were interested in cosmology from that early on, or was it more of a general astrophysics type thing? Yeah, so I was an astrophysicist as an undergrad, so I studied astrophysics, mm -hmm. um, but I've always wanted to do cosmology because cosmology's, um, cosmology asks questions like, you know, how did the universe begin? What does its structure look like? If you really, really zoom out on the largest of scales, mm -hmm. um, you know, where do these galaxies and, you know, and stars and so on come from? And so I really wanted to study those questions. I had no idea what that meant in practice. I didn't really have um, cosmology classes as an undergrad, um, but I wanted, I knew to, you know, I wanted, I knew I wanted to answer those questions. So um, I decided to come work with somebody who is tackling those questions. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm wondering to, to what extent have the questions been answered and, and what what remains? I'm sure we'll, we'll get into specifics when we talk about your line of research, but it seems like we have a pretty complete picture. Like I've, I've seen documentaries that talk about us knowing the conditions of like a second after the Big Bang happened, which seems very, very specific. So I wonder what's left. Yeah, that's a very good question. What's left is 95% of the <laughs> Yeah. Um, so one amazing discovery or a series of discoveries that we've made only in recent maybe few decades, um, starting from uh, in the 60s and 70s when we started realizing there is uh, dark matter, that the main form of matter in the universe is not any of the stuff that makes up stars and galaxies and us and mm -hmm. planets, but it's something totally different, some perhaps new particles. Um, this was a discovery made by, uh, by Vera Rubin. And uh, then we also discovered in the 90s that our universe is um, in a state of explosion. It's expanding and it's expanding ever faster, faster and faster every second. Um, and this was done by um, uh, recent Palmer groups. And this was inferred to be due to something even stranger that we call dark energy. So this dark matter and dark energy, that's what our universe is made out of. And it's not any of the stuff we know and understand from you know, particle physics experiments. It is not a part of standard particle physics. So that's mm -hmm. the only thing that's left to figure out. Um, yeah. And that is what you know, the core research in cosmology is about. What is the nature of dark matter? What is the nature of dark energy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm so, so surprised that, that's, that that was only discovered as recently as the 90s. I mean, well, I was born in the 90s, but so, so it makes sense that I've heard about it ever since I grew up, but I, I figured that that was a more core finding that was maybe earlier, like in Einstein's time, it's it's surprising to see how recent that is. Yeah, so um, so Einstein has uh, had this idea of 
um, what we call a cosmological constant. He had this mathematical notion that there could be something in our universe that's kind of stabilizing it, that's making it um, remain static and not collapse under all that gravity of all those galaxies and stars and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, but then he later, you know, when the expansion of the universe was discovered, he called this notion the biggest blunder of his life. So this is um, this is the story of Einstein's blunder, right? It's the cosmological constant idea. It turns out in the 90s, not only do we need the universe to stay static, we actually need to make it expand and we need to make it expand real fast and faster and faster. So you definitely need this cosmological constant. Um, that was kind of a rebirth of that idea. Um, and now we think that maybe it's not a constant, maybe it's something physical, maybe a new field um, that we don't yet understand that's making for this accelerated expansion. So the idea was kind of there, but data was shocking when it came about because, let me try to explain this because this is this is a really fascinating story. So if you, um, and I regret I don't have like my usual props because the classes are over, but I'll use a hair clip. But um, if you throw an object up into the air, right? What do you expect will happen? It will turn around and come back down to the earth. Mm -hmm. If you throw it real hard, the speed uh, that you know we launch rockets with, what it's gonna do, it's gonna you know escape the gravity of the Earth, and it will just continue floating in outer space at a constant speed. What it will never do is break off from the gravity of the Earth and then keep accelerating and going away from us faster and faster and faster and faster. And that's exactly what our universe is doing. So this is something just outside, completely outside the, the intuitive world we're in touch with uh, here on Earth. And that is due to this dark energy. We call it such a mysterious name because it does such a weird thing to our whole uh, universe. Yeah, I have, I have many more questions I want to ask. But I think, I think first, um, both for me and for our listeners, it would be good to, to, have, uh, to have you go over kind of the Big Bang and, and just what happens and... and, and what what how, how matter came into being I guess because because I have some understanding of it and I imagine some people have a basic idea but uh, what I'm I'm hoping you can give the specifics we need without making it too technical I hope that's not too much of a of an ask oh yeah absolutely um, so believe me when I say in order for me to feel like I understand the things I'm talking about I need to be able to explain it in in non technical terms so this is mm -hmm. this is my pleasure <laughs> to do um, so. How did the universe begin? Let me preface by saying that I am a firm believer that the science of cosmology um, is oftentimes way simpler than many other things that have to do with studies of humans, right? So neuroscience, for example, is such a complicated and complex um, thing that I think sometimes we actually do understand our entire universe a whole lot better than we understand you know, and are able to, to um, parse out humans. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this might sound surprising because most people have this notion that like, oh, you're a physicist, you're super smart, you, have, you do very, very difficult things. But the reality is that um, today the universe is complex. It has all these beautiful structures we see in the night sky and many processes are happening that shape them and things like that. But if you rewind the clock back towards the beginning, um, at very, very early times, our universe was very, very simple. It was basically a sea of plasma, um, particles like protons, electrons, some dark matter, some radiation, things like that, um, all at a constant temperature in what we call thermal equilibrium, kind of like a star, okay, kind of like the interior of a star, and uh, very, very smooth with no structure, no bumps, no galaxies, nothing, uh, nothing else. So, so you, you, system, oh, go ahead. You say a constant temperature, but but from from what I've heard, it started off as this like incredibly dense and hot singularity, and it, everything was super hot, and then it just started oh. rapidly cooling. So yeah, 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 yeah. I meant constant temperature across space. So okay. at any point in time, it was a very homogeneous, very uniform, um, you know, sea of plasma. This is what I mean by constant temperature. And yes, of course, as you go back in time, the temperature rises. Mm -hmm. um, and so the universe is much cooler now because it's expanded so much, right? So the yeah. temperature definitely changes as a function of time. 
Uh, but early on, the universe had no structure. There were no galaxies. There were like these dense condensations of matter. Um, there was not much going on other than the sea of, of particles. And so that kind of system is really very, very easy for physicists to model and explain and understand and imagine, yeah. you know, describe with our mathematical equations. And so because of that, uh, we're able to like look at observations of this very early universe and you know, seek for things that, that represent signals of new physics. Because we understand it in such detail, we can predict how it looks like in great detail. And so mm -hmm. tiny, tiny deviations from our predictions can be blaring signals of like new particles or you know, new, new emerging laws of physics that we weren't understanding before. Mm -hmm. So we do understand a whole lot about the early universe. And we have fantastic observations um, that kind of span the cosmic history. Um, and so there are a lot of pieces of puzzle that we've been able to put together. Um, but so far, putting together all these pieces of puzzle kind of just show to us how big the puzzle is and how much more there is, um, there is to do. Yeah. So when you hear about the early universe, I, I often hear it framed in terms of this kind of like atomic soup or, or plasma, like you mentioned. And it talks about, you know, various forms of matter as we know it, but it, I've never heard anyone talk about dark matter in the early universe. So is was it was it still the same composition? Like, did it make up the same percent of mass and energy? Yeah, so we think it did. Um, for as far as we can probe in our universe, um, there was there is evidence of dark matter. Um, dark matter is 85% of all matter in the universe. So 15%, mm -hmm. that's our normal stuff. That's the atoms and particles we are made out of and all the stars that we can see in the sky. So put that all together, 15%, everything else, dark matter, we don't know. Um, we don't know the properties of. But what we can do is we can do exactly what I had just um, um, told you about is we can say, okay, if we have um, let's 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 imagine we have no dark matter in the early universe back when everything began mm -hmm. at the Big Bang. Let's imagine there's no dark matter. That situation will never give birth to galaxies that we see around us today. So the power of cosmology is to connect the times right after the Big Bang when the universe was born and was simple and small to this beautiful, versatile, you know, set of objects that we see all around us in the universe today. And those theories demand that we put in that much dark matter from the very beginning in order for everything to look like the universe we see around us today. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So is your specific research area also looking at dark matter or is this one of just the big or mysteries that's fun to talk about? Yeah, I've worked on dark energy and dark matter. I'm focusing on dark matter and as you can already guess, dark matter in the early universe, um, these days in particular. Um, and so this has been one of the things that me and my group at USC have been able to, um, to sort of figure out is how do we probe various theories of dark matter uh, using these observations of our universe? How do we link the microscopic um, particles to you know, what galaxies look like, these giant systems that we, that we see around us today? Mm -hmm. So one, one theory I've heard about dark matter is the WIMP theory, these weakly interacting massive particles. And from, from what I understand, well, they're, they're bigger, and which is why they have so much mass and energy, and they're weakly interacting, which is why we can't see it. But it seems like if that were true, then when the universe was much denser, there, there would probably be more interaction. So ha, do you know of any evidence to, to suggest that? Yeah, exactly. This is exactly the idea behind the research that we've done. So um, if you have, you know, weakly interacting particles today and you pack them into volume with much more matter, which is to say, rewind the clock and go back to early times when everything was denser and hotter, you will have more interactions. And so we use exactly this feature of our universe, the fact that things were denser and hotter early on um, to say, okay, but if things were denser and hotter, then they must have interacted a whole lot more. So that's a really good testing ground for all of our theories. It's a more sensitive probe in some sense of these interactions um, than what you might have in the present day universe. And so we've been able to rewind the clock and figure out how much interactions um, are you allowed to have at most without, for example, erasing small galaxies from the existence mm -hmm. today. 
And making this connection gives us some of the most stringent, you know, constraints on what the theory of dark matter might possibly be. Yeah, that's very interesting. So this is some of your more recent research, or was this back when you were doing your PhD? Yeah, this was my more recent research, actually with undergraduates here at USC. One of my undergrads, Karim Amari, uh, has just written a paper that is um, that puts these stringent bounds uh, on dark matter interactions from looking at the galaxies in our universe today. Wow, that's great. So I want to return to this, but could you uh, could you tell me more about what you were doing during your PhD, what you found, and, and maybe during your postdoc years as well, and then how that led to this? Um, so yes, I can I can do that. So during my PhD, I did my PhD at Caltech um, with um, uh, my advisor at the time was Mark Kimiokovsky. Um, he's a great cosmologist and a great mentor. Uh, so Mark had me uh, look into um, specific models for dark energy this time. So I started off looking into dark energy. Um, and in particular, he had me um, uh, figure out what would be observable effects um, of this dark energy fluid uh, interacting with photons, with the you know, particles of light as we see it today. And so the result of that work was uh, to use uh, something we call the cosmic microwave background radiation. This is basically a radio echo from the Big Bang, the oldest light we can see in the universe. It's today, it's in radio waves. Uh, we can see it no matter what direction we look in the sky, it's coming at us from all directions. Um, so this is the heat left over from the Big Bang. Um, when you look at that radiation, uh, you can we can measure it today in, in really great detail. Um, you can search for how, um, for evidence of dark energy kind of messing it up in places. And so I use those measurements um, in order to place some of the uh, most recent bounds on, on some of the models of dark energy that we had at the time. Yeah. That was and my PhD work. There's an interesting story behind that background radiation, isn't there? I, I, I think I remember hearing something like it was originally discovered just, well, not by scientists, but by people with a powerful radio and they didn't know what it was. Yep, yep. Um, so this was the discovery made by Penzias and Wilson in the 60s um, in uh, using a, a Bell Labs observatory in New Jersey. So they were looking for something totally different. They were not after um, the you know signal from the Big Bang. Um, they were doing some other measurements and they just encountered this nuisance of a signal that was just everywhere. And they, could, they were trying to get rid of it. They did everything they could to, um, to get rid of it. And they even scraped up their telescope trying to clear out the uh, dielectric material deposited by pigeons. Um, and none of that helped. Eventually they realized that another group from Princeton University, just you know, some miles down the road, um, has been searching for exactly that signal as the relic from the times of the Big Bang. And so they you know, reported their discovery, they scooped the other group, um, and eventually got the Nobel Prize. Um, so that was that was quite a story of kind of an accidental major discovery in cosmology. Yeah, that's very cool. But they already had like a theoretical idea of what it should look like, and then it just matched onto it. Or did it oh, come the, before the, the guys at Princeton did? Yeah, this is the so the guys at Princeton had a theoretical idea. Um, actually, Jim Peebles, um, whom I had the pleasure to run into many times in corridors at Princeton University, had this idea and has been searching with his team uh, for, for the cosmic microwave background. Uh, Penzias and Wilson had no predictions. They were not thinking about the early universe. Um, and as luck would have it, you know, the experimentalists ended up getting a Nobel Prize. Jim Peebles just got a Nobel Prize a, year, a few years ago. So like many, many decades after, um, after the discovery. But yes, they had a theoretical prediction and this was finding the signal was one of the most beautiful um, confirmations of the Big Bang theory of this idea that the universe started much denser, much hotter and basically uniform and then expanded and slowly formed structures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like ma many of the great discoveries are, are really like validating these theoretical ideas like you've heard about in the last decade or so um, gravitational waves and the Higgs boson, all of these were, were predicted decades earlier, right? And then only later did our technology catch up to be able to observe them. Yep, this is true. Um, although I have to say in the coming years, um, just a couple of years down the road, we'll have 
um, some of the biggest surveys of our universe starting by a whole wide range of observatories. Um, some of these observational collaborations USC is involved with, like the next cosmic microwave background observatory. Uh, it's called the Simons Observatory. Um, so all of these are going to deliver such tremendous amount of data that I suspect that in the coming decade, the discoveries may actually be data driven. We may stumble upon things our theories haven't predicted, and that'll be super exciting. Yeah, that, that sounds exciting, definitely. Is, are there any examples of that that, um, that that you can think of that came like data first and then theory second? We'd, we found the finding before we had a, an idea of what it was? Yeah, I mean, the expansion, the accelerated expansion of the universe was not expected at the point uh, where when the groups in the late 90s went to to measure the expansion rate, what was expected is that the universe is slowing down, most likely, mm -hmm. or maybe going with the same rate um, at, at best, right? Yeah. Um, but then what they found is actually there is, you know, <laughs> there's something we, we did not know about. So forget about the fact that I, Einstein had the idea of cosmological constant at that point in time, we thought matter is all that there is and matter has gravity. Gravity makes, you know, the ball turn around or at best continue going. Um, it will never make it accelerate. So that was a shock um, to the community, but a pleasant one because it's opening the door towards some of the stuff we never knew existed. Yeah, that's a perfect example. So we keep throwing around these terms, dark matter and energy, and I, I sort of have an idea of what they're doing, but I, I don't, I can't tell which is which exactly. I know that dark energy is supposed to take up more of the universe than dark matter, and it's the dark energy that drives the expansion, right? So then, well, first, is that right? And then second, if dark energy is the one doing the expansion, what is dark matter doing? Oh, yeah. So um, what dark matter is, it's, it's matter. It's probably some new particles uh, we just haven't yet seen and haven't measured, haven't weighed them. Like, you know, we know the mass of an electron and proton, and we know how these guys, you know, scatter off each other. Um, we can describe those interactions, the scattering, the bumping into each other. Um, we don't know any of those properties about dark matter particles, but how do we then know they're there? Well, we know they're there um, because everywhere we look in our universe, um, whatever observational data we look, we see evidence that the universe has more matter, um, in fact, about six times more matter than what we can account for if we just count up all the stars and all the gas that we see and all the dust and, and so forth. Um, and so what dark matter is, it's really what galaxies are made out of. This is really the really, you know, the true stuff that galaxies are made out of. Um, all this star stuff is just kind of an icing on the cake. It's just stuff that happened to be on top that we can see. Um, but real, real, you know, bulk of every galaxy is this dark matter. So mm -hmm. what does dark matter do? It makes all the structures in our universe from galaxies upwards. Um, it is the main source of gravity um, in our universe. For example, it is the stuff that makes the galaxies spin way faster than they should if they were only made out of stars and gas. Mm -hmm. So we see galaxies spinning so fast that they should just fly apart. But there is more gravity that's holding them and we can measure uh, the amount of this gravity, the amount of dark matter by seeing how the things we can see move around, right? So, um, so that's dark matter. Dark energy is something totally weird. It's something, you know, it's not matter. And this is why we dubbed it dark energy. Um, it's dark something that isn't matter. That's what that means. It's just a label. Um, it's basically this really, really tenuous substance that we think um, fills the vacuum of space between galaxies. Um, unlike dark matter, it doesn't, it doesn't condense, it doesn't curdle to form uh, galaxies. It's just very smooth, uniform everywhere. But if you really zoom out the picture of our universe, you really, really zoom out as much as possible and you ask in this volume that I'm looking at, there is billions of galaxies um, and I can compute what the density of those of matter in that volume is, the density of dark energy is larger on large, large scales. So what that does is it means that dark energy gets to dictate how large volumes of our universe are expanding and behaving as a whole. Mm -hmm. So if it's not matter, is it similar to like a photon, which doesn't have mass, but has energy? It isn't radiation either. Um, it's not matter. It's not radiation. It's something that behaves very, very differently. Mm -hmm. Let me illustrate that. So 
if you have, imagine you have a volume, um, like a balloon, for example, and it's filled with air, right? Um, imagine now that you somehow made the balloon expand, but don't blow it up anymore. Don't put any more air into it. Just expand the balloon. What happens to the density of the air in the balloon? It goes down. It goes, goes down. Um, and that's what matter does. Its mm -hmm. density goes down as the volume you've put it into expands. This is normal stuff, right? Radiation also cools. Not only does it does its uh, density go down, but also it cools down um, because of this expansion. So this is matter and radiation. We know that stuff. We understand that stuff. Um, dark energy, you expand the balloon and there is the same density of it in the balloon. You expand it some more, there is still the same density. You expand it some more, still the same density. So as you expand the universe, there is kind of overall, in some sense, more and more of it. It's as if it's a part of the vacuum itself. So this is very weird, right? And outside of our intuition. So what, what makes us look at it as a substance rather than some other constant, like maybe the gravitational constant or like some force that isn't matter or energy, but it's also not, not a substance? Yeah, so I like to use the word substance to mean everything that there is, everything we can pack into physical theories. Um, but what kind of you know, material or substance it is um, that's something, you know, we're still trying uh, to figure out. So it could be that this dark energy is actually can even have particles, um, you know, that could interact in certain ways with dark matter and other stuff. So far, we don't see any evidence of that. It just doesn't look to be doing anything. In fact, it looks very much like cosmological constant, like a property of the vacuum um, itself. And, you know, particle physicists have ideas um, that try to explain dark energy by means of a simple cosmological constant. We don't know. Mm -hmm. So there's there's two other things I want to ask about, two, two big ideas, two big rabbit holes we can go down. So one is the idea of, of quantum gravity or the idea of we having like these two theories of the universe, this quantum theory and our, our classical physics and how they don't merge. Uh, so that, that's one of them. And then the second one is, is the more philosophical ideas of even if we could map out everything mathematically, um, what then? Um, but so I'll, I'll leave it to you uh, for which one you want to start with just in the interest of time. Yeah, so, so this is where, where uh, you're hitting the boundary of my knowledge as a cosmologist and astrophysicist. And I will recommend uh, some of the folks from our department that, that would be um, even better subjects to, to <laughs> down those rabbit holes, but I'll give you my answer. Um, yeah, it is a problem um, in modern physics to unify gravity with the rest of the forces to quantize gravity um, while you're also dealing with all the other stuff um, that exists in our universe. Um, but one thing that I will say as a cosmologist is cosmology or looking at our entire universe um, at once is actually going to be a way to test these theories because cosmology is where particle physics um, and the you know the 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 world of microscopic interfaces, the world of macroscopic, um, and so even if you think about things, if you've heard of uh, theory of inflation, right, uh -huh. that that is this idea that our universe exponentially expanded, right, um, at the Big Bang, basically. This is the idea that this is how our universe started. Um, and this idea kind of uses quantum fluctuations um, of some fields that existed at that point in time to explain the origins of, um, of everything we see in the universe today, of structure in the universe today, and also of all the matter and energy in the universe today. So when we dig really deep to the core beginnings of everything in cosmology, we have to deal uh, with gravity and really, really small particles at the same time. And so I wouldn't be surprised if ultimate tests of, um, of all these uh, unifying theories actually come uh, from cosmological studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it being outside of your ex area of expertise, um, which one do you use? Because it seems like people, if un unless they're trying to, to solve this particular problem, they're probably relying on, on one or the other, right? Yeah. Um, we usually, so most of most of the observations, so I'm very data-driven cosmologist. What I do is, and maybe I should have prefaced with this, 
Um, what I'm really interested in is testing fundamental physics theories using cosmological observations. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I talk to theorists, I think about ways, you know, that we can probe different theories, uh, but then I do data analysis. So what I'm really undercover is I'm a data analysis person who looks and searches through various data sets with, um, with innovative statistical methods uh, to try to say something about fundamental physics. So I will go as far as the data goes and the data that we have um, right now, um, the times that we're probing in the early universe, we can still focus on, you know, the expansion of the universe as a whole is described by uh, general relativity and general relativity works seems to work really fine um, and then we deal with inside of this universe there are particles and we know how they will behave um, living in a universe that's expanding so we never have to deal never yet had to deal uh, with you know unifying with something like quantum gravity or something like that but there are certainly um, ideas for how we might test some of these theories um, I just haven't worked on them yet yeah. So do, does this make you more of an experimentalist for, from a physicist standpoint, dealing only with data, or are you somewhere in between? I'm exactly in between. Um, so, you know, 30% of my work will be paper and pen. You know, let's figure out if dark matter is really the swim particle, what will that do to galaxies today? Let's, let's figure out, let's make the connection, right? That's the paper and pen work. Um, and then, you know, 70% of it is let's debug this code to analyze this data and really squeeze it for information, extract everything we can, um, figure out how to extract new information we've never gotten our hands on before and so on. So I'm really, really in between. And that's very common in, in astrophysics. There are people who build experiments. There are people who do just mathematical theory. And then there are people like me who um, use data to connect theory and experiment. OK, yeah, I think I think this is a great overview of your work. It's, it's very, very interesting. If, if there's anything else um, you want to add, um, let me know and go ahead. But, but otherwise, I want to get, get more abstract. And I know, I know that many of these questions you wouldn't be able to answer. Um, but, but yeah, first, is, is there anything else that, that you want to add or clear up? I'm going to see if, if you ask me the question I, I want to, <laughs> I want to be asked. If not, I will volunteer um, my well, thoughts. Yeah, volunteer it because I'll have plenty of questions, so we can start where you want to start. Um, so I think one of the most, I was talking to my um, eight-year-old son uh, the other day, and he's a very curious kid, as kids are, and uh, sometimes they throw really big thoughts at him, and uh, it's, it's fascinating to me how kids can sometimes process things adults get hung up on, um, so I experiment on him, really. So I told him uh, one of the most fascinating things about our universe is that um, well, there are two things that are most fascinating to me. One is that every single atom that uh, you know allows for life, carbon, oxygen, uh, nitrogen, all of that stuff, everything but hydrogen, by the, but the simplest possible atom, um, is made in dying stars. So every atom we have you know, to thank for existing as human beings, as life, um, was once a part of a star. So generations of stars needed to, you know, live and die in order for us to arise from this cosmic dust. I think that's fascinating. I still marvel at, at this very simple fact that we study in astrophysics. Um, yeah. The other thing that I think is like super exciting and mysterious is that math works in physics. Mm -hmm. I still can't wrap my head around that. Um, you know, we do things like what you said, we make predictions, we make theoretical predictions. What does it mean? We take math. <laughs> And we, you know, take what we know about the physical world, and then we do some scribbles on the paper that we call mathematically consistent, whatever that means. Math is a construct of human mind, right? Um, so we make these mathematically consistent calculations, and out comes the prediction that you know there should be a Higgs boson, or that you know um, dark matter behaves in a certain way given given the data that we have, and so forth, and it works. Lo and behold, there is Higgs boson. You know, we make predictions about the physical world using mathematics. Um, why does it work so well? Yeah, that is one of the big questions I wanted to ask you because even even among philosophers, there's this debate of is math like just a human concept, a tool that works incredibly well, or is it is it something that exists even outside of us and we've discovered it? And 
well, I lean towards the discovery side, but I'm wondering what you think of it. Yeah, probably. <laughs> that seems to be consistent with, with how it's working, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, why? Why would it work so well? Yeah. And then this is where things get very complicated, or at least very, very abstract, because, you know, behind this whole conversation, I've, I've been thinking of and waiting the whole, um, okay, but why did the Big Bang even happen? Why does the universe even exist at all? And it's, it's not a question that can ever be answered definitively, but it's, it's certainly interesting to think about. But when you pair that idea, the idea that this universe came into being somehow, and not only that, but it came in with a, a set of laws that are more or less constant and waiting to be discovered and, and like whole systems of math and logic that seem self-evident. Uh, you ask where that comes from too. And, <laughs> and when you compare it to like computer programs, it, I, I start to wonder, are, are all of these formulas we're discovering analogous to like some higher dimensional um, form of code? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, yeah, well, a lot of us wonder these questions. Uh, you know, don't don't tell my uh, my department, but of course, this is in all our minds. Um, why why does it all work the way that it does? Why is the universe the way that it is? Um, I think it's really important to um, you know for physicists, for us as physicists, to kind of like not go in the direction of arrogance and and try to claim that everything um, that we can conceive as humans can be necessarily explained. Um, within the construct of physics as we have it right now. So questions like, you know, why did the Big Bang happen? If you want to be, um, you know, pedantic about it, uh, you, by construction, you cannot act, answer a question of why did it happen? Because what you're asking by it is what was the cause of the Big Bang? And how can there be a cause of the beginning of time? There's nothing before the Big yeah. Bang. <laughs> Um, for there to be conversation about causality. So that alone, I know I sound like probably many popular TV shows that, that you may have heard, but that alone, you know, demonstrates that the same kind of structures we have are not going to apply to that. So this is where we as cosmologists have to be satisfied with asking the questions about things we can test and see and constructing self-consistent understanding of the world that we are able to probe. And then the stuff beyond it, we have to resort to other, um, perhaps other means. So your yeah. question about, is there something beyond, um, that's kind of starting to resemble the question of like, is there a multiverse? Are there many dimensions? Um, you know, is there some bigger framework we could be working within? And if you ask my colleagues in the physics department, a lot of people think that, uh, you know, this bigger framework might be the string theory. Um, and it may be so that, um, that the laws of physics kind of emerge from this large self-consistent theory um, and all the answers are kind of within it. Um, but the problem is, even if there is another universe uh, that's completely disconnected from ours and many other universes, I don't know how to probe them, so I can't test this. Plus so you, you still have to ask, where did they come from? <laughs> so yes, it's the same um, question. So maybe, this maybe, but, but the things that we can really get a grip on are the things that are the theories that have predictions we can actually test. And whenever, you know, string theorists or, um, or particle physicists come to cosmologists with, with things that can be tested, we get super excited. We always welcome that. Um, but yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe we need a new system to ponder this, these deeper philosophical questions. Yeah, so I do, I do want to entertain these questions as much as possible while also stay, not, not venturing off to questions that just could never be empirically proven. So one is, well, you know, whether whether there's a multiverse or not, it seems like the answer has to either be we're this universe is everything that there is, or there's something outside of it. And if there's something outside of it, we can never really test that. But so within the, you know, hypothetically, this is all that there is framework. One question is, is it deterministic? Like if we could redo the Big Bang, would we would would this universe come into being the exact same way every no. single time. <laughs> no. Um, so, so there is a component of, of th this, this much we, we do understand at this point in time. Um, we know the laws of physics, even on the microscopic level, but we know 
that some of them are probabilistic. What does that mean? It means that um, given a set of initial conditions, set up your system, begin, rewind the clock to the beginning, mm -hmm. um, you only can predict the probability that the outcome is one way. Uh, but then there are other possibilities, some of which are equally likely, some of which are less likely. And that is as much as our microscopic theory can, can go. Um, this is not necessarily an impediment. This is a feature of our, of our world on very small scales. Um, and because of this feature and because our universe started off microscopic, smaller than the smallest particles we, we can see today, uh, it was subject to this probabilistic, you know, jittery nature of our um, of, of reality. And so if you run the clock and start it again, uh, you won't get the same galaxy in the same place. But what you will get is the same set of physical laws and overall the same picture. The big traits of our universe would be the same, we think. Um, but, you know, details like, is there a galaxy right here? Does it look exactly the same? Those details may differ. So I'm wondering about when, how, to what degree things need to exist for there to be a probability. So for example, if you take a coin that has heads or tails, the probability of it landing one way or the other is 50-50. But even if it lands heads, and even if you know it, it failed to achieve tails, we know that the tails side exists. So if the universe is probabilistic, and even if everything that happens is one probability, that seems to sort of imply that there's like, you know, hypothetically another side of the coin or other probabilities that would have to exist somewhere. And I'm, does, does that fall into the realm of, of anything that could be tested? Yes. Um, and actually, uh, cosmology uses um, the, let me try to explain this. This, this gets, this gets a little bit more involved. So, so bear with me. Um, so cosmology uses probabilistic nature of the microscopic um, and the fact that the universe started microscopic to parse out the observations um, in very different regions of our universe as in some sense realizations, separate different realizations of the same physics. Much like what you said, if you rewind the clock, will the universe look different? We can kind of test how it, you know, like what, what, are, what is the realm of possibilities? What are all the options? What are all the heads and tails that we, well, um, that, that we have, you know, had on the plate and ended up in this galaxy, in this universe right now. The way we do that is when we look at, for example, diametrically opposing directions in the sky, um, and we look at this cosmic microwave background, this, this um, you know, uh, leftover heat from the Big Bang, we actually see many, many um, regions in this cosmic microwave background that used to be totally separate universes that didn't communicate with each other, um, totally separate regions that only recently came into contact with each other. So in some sense, uh, these represents like a, a mosaic of little baby pictures of the universe of many universes um, that we can actually look at when we look at different directions in the sky. Mm -hmm. I know this is a lot. When you say universe, is that more like metaphorical, like in the same way that a very far away galaxy that wouldn't communicate with us is like another universe? Or do you mean like something more literal? Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, regions of space time that at the time that this light started traveling to us had nothing to do ever in the history with each other. So the light that's coming from over there and the light that's coming from over there, the radio light, um, those two never communicated. They just never had a chance to exchange photons or send signals to each other. They were never in contact. And so uh, now all these photons are coming to us and we see them at the same time, but they never were in touch with each other. This is the sense in which I mean universe is disconnected regions that had no opportunity to know about each other. Mm -hmm. um, so when we look at that, in some sense, we are really probing the space of possibilities. Oh, look at that. That little universe over there is, is fraction of a degree hotter than the one over here. And this one over there is kind of in between and so forth. And when we piece all of that together, 
um, what we get is um, we actually use the fact that we see our universe when it was so young and so disconnected, full of these disconnected patches, uh, to in some sense put together what that probability um, looked like, you know, that space of possibilities, uh, what that looked like. So this is a very, you know, this is kind of um, the basis uh, uh, of what we call cosmological principle. Uh, this idea that our region of space is not any special uh, and no other region of space is special. And so from over here, we can test various possibilities and see, um, you know, backtrack what was there in the beginning in a sense. Mm -hmm. So this, this means again, like if we could imagine re redoing or, or simulating another universe, the, the map of background radiation would just look different every single time. Yes, exactly. It would look different in the sense um, that and I should have really brought my props. I, I totally <laughs> have a spark with a map of the universe, but um, it would look different in the sense that hotter and colder regions will be organized differently. But overall, the statistical description of this map, um, like how many on average, how many hot regions there are on average, how many cold there are on average, all of that will be the same. Mm -hmm. So there's a global sense in which these different maps um, are actually the same, but not in detail. Mm -hmm. Right. And the total amount of mass and energy also has to be the same every time. Is that, is that right? That's the assumption. When I tell the story, that's what I'm assuming. I'm assuming that we're starting with the same conditions, uh, but just making the universe from the beginning, from the same ingredients. Mm -hmm. um, whether we had to have this amount of mass and energy, um, and whether there are other completely disconnected universes that we haven't been in touch with in any way, that have different amounts of mass and energy, that's something I don't know. That's something that's very hard to test. Um, if we are still out of contact. Right. One, one problem I think I've heard, well, I don't know if this is a problem, but when, when mass or information enters a black hole, it's seemingly gone forever, but then also the, the amount of information in the universe has to stay constant, at least in theory. So do you think, what, what do you think? Do you think it's actually being stored in there somehow, or do you think the theory might be wrong? I don't know. Uh, this is, you know, what you're getting at is kind of the frontier of research um, that people like Cliff Johnson, Clifford Johnson and uh, Nick Warner in our department are doing. And I, I would love to hear their answer to that question. Um, but it really is the, the cutting edge of the, of the research in physics today. Yeah. What, el what else is cutting edge, especially in back, back um, in, in your specialty that you can talk about more in depth? Yeah, so other than the nature of dark matter and dark energy, um, it is interesting um, to think about how, again, like how cosmology has kind of become a way to really test particle physics in ways that we really can hope to do uh, in a laboratory. So we're used to thinking of, you know, particle physics, you smash particles together, uh, you get something out, and that's, that's how we learn about particles. It turns out that um, this Simons Observatory that I was mentioning to you, one of our big science goals, apart from the nature of dark matter and dark energy, is to simply measure the mass of neutrino particles, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, we've known about neutrinos for a really long time. They're kind of these ghost particles that go right through the earth and just, you know, fly through uh, something like a light year of lead without, uh, without ever bumping into another uh, atom or another particle. They're really, really ghost particles. They're tiny. And so it's very hard to measure their mass. It's really hard to catch them and weigh them. Um, and so we've been, you know, we've discovered, um, and that was a Nobel Prize um, just a few years ago, uh, or fairly recently, uh, we've discovered that neutrinos tend to uh, kind of convert from one kind of neutrino to another kind of neutrino. And if they do that, our mathematical models um, tell us that they can only do that if they have mass that's not zero. So they cannot be like photons, massless. They must have some small, 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 small mass. Um, and now the name of the game in particle physics has been, let's measure them. That'll tell us a lot about their nature. Um, turns out that cosmological observations of the cosmic microwave background can do that for us. We can measure the tiny mass of the neutrino particles because they are part of our universe and their mass 
changes the way that galaxies look like in our universe throughout cosmic history. Even the tiny mass, the tiny contribution um, on cosmological scales matters. And so we're likely to return the very first measurement of the neutrino mass uh, from these cosmological observations within wow. the next decade. So you, you're you basically running a bunch of simulations, trying out different masses, and you don't know which is right, but then you just, you look at the one that look most closely resembles our universe. That's exactly right. That is exactly how we infer um, various numbers that we're interested in. This is how we infer how much matter there is in the universe overall, how much dark matter and so forth. We run the simulations or sometimes we're lucky and we can just calculate things on pen and paper and we check to see if, it, if it's right. <laughs> and then mm -hmm. if it doesn't work, we change the number and we find the number that works for our universe. Mm -hmm. It's very cool. So the last thing I wanna ask about is the, the role of subjectivity in the universe, I guess, or, and, and maybe I, this, this might be just a po popular misconception that you could dispel, but th so there's the idea um, in quantum physics of things changing depending on whether or not you observe them. Um, so may maybe you could talk about that in more detail, just, just overview um, what the, the phenomena in, in better detail than I can for our listeners. And then we could talk about uh, what that actually means yeah, so um, it isn't that things change whether or not you observe them. It's that once you've observed a system that used to be just a probabilistic thing uh, where you know you, you could tell about the system, it has a probability to look like this or like this or like this or like this. And these are the probabilities for each one of these uh, different states. Once you take a measurement, you mess it up, you interact with it, you make it different. All of a sudden, when you take a measurement, you become a part of the system with what you're trying to measure. And so we call this um, you know, collapse of the, um, of the wave function of the system. So what does that, what does that mean? It just means um, you've picked out one of the possibilities when you, once you've done the measurement, and now you know what that is, but you couldn't pick out a specific state without interacting with the system and making it different. So it's never possible uh, to take a measurement and know what the state exactly is to go from probabilistic, probabilistic description to a particular description to deterministic without messing the system up. Um, so in that sense, there is subjectivity, uh, but not in the you know colloquial sense of the word. Yeah. So so. Maybe we can tie this to the famous Schrodinger's cat experiment just, just to make it easier to digest. So the idea is, <laughs> it's a very morbid example, but it's it's something like there's a ticking time bomb in, in the box that has the cat and we don't know when it's gonna go off, it's random. And until we check, we don't know if the cat is dead or alive. So we say it's both, right? Yep. So, yeah. so most people, struggle with the idea that it's both. They say, what do you mean? It, it has to be one or the other. We just don't know yet. Um, so could, could you talk about how, how at least um, mathematically, I guess, or, or experimentally, we've shown that it, it actually has to be both and not just unknown? Yeah, so, uh, so one uh, cosmological example was this story of observing the little disconnected regions of the universe um, and seeing all the possibilities. We can do the same thing um, in, in particle physics. Um, and so if it were not, you know, if it were not for this probability distribution, uh, then our experimental outcomes would look very different. Um, you would always get one or the other. Um, but sometimes you can, you know, you can verify that you can kind of get both at the same time. Um, the way to think about this is, you know, if you don't measure something and has no consequence to what you're doing, right? Like you, you're trying to determine what state the system is in right now, uh, but it's not in contact in anything you care about, um, anything that would have consequence to you. So what does it matter? Which, you know, like what, why is it a hang up that it could be in both, right? If it's consistent with all the data that, that you're taking, allow it to be in both states. It's just our human um, preconception that, you know, um, that it must be, that the world must be deterministic that kind of presents a hang up for that. Um, but what we've discovered is that really we need to think about 
um, this microscopic world in terms of probabilities in order to explain everything that we see. So it's just a construct that we use uh, to think about things and predict things um, that works very, very well. Yeah. So I'm wondering now, you, you've heard the, the saying like, the, if a tree falls and no one's there to hear it, does it actually make a sound? And the physicist is going to say like, yeah, of course, it, it exerts a force and there's like sound waves that travel and all that. And, and it doesn't matter whether you're there to observe them or not. Um, but it seems like with this with this quantum analogy, you, you talked about entering the system. So you, the information is lost to you until you can interact with it. But then it isn't the entire universe a system like I, I'm missing how there can be parts that have that can be isolated, because it seems like everything's always interacting no matter what. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Well, we know that every interaction travels with a finite speed. Every uh, signal in our universe, there's a universal speed limit, right? It's the speed of light. Nothing travels faster than the speed of light. So if you imagine that at the beginning of time, you start with two observers, one here and one here, right? And then you start expanding the space between them. Um, and you expand it um, really, really fast, such that light trying to get from one to the other um, at the time when you're asking them, hey, have you seen from the other guy? Um, has not yet made it there, okay? Mm -hmm. So you can imagine, you can make up a construct where there are two spots in your universe that have never gotten the time for life from one to come to the other. Now, if you let more time go by, um, they, the light will come, okay? Provided the universe is not expanding too fast. And now they are in contact. Okay, so whether two regions of space have been in contact with each other and connected um, is a statement, is a question that will have different answers depending on at what point in cosmic history are you asking. Mm -hmm. So right? there must have been enough time for light, at least light, if not even some heavier sluggish particles to get from one to the other in order for these two guys to connect, right? Mm -hmm. What about gravity? Because it, it seems like, you know, even if you imagined literally the two edges of the universe uh, way, way faster than light could ever reach with the expansion. Wouldn't gravity always be interacting? Wouldn't it always have just an incredibly weak force? Yeah, so, so gravity is in some sense a little bit uh, different or rather the, the description of entire space-time and the expansion of the entire space-time is a little bit different. But, but the gravitational force, when you think of it in terms of like, for example, the gravity of our sun holding the earth in the orbit, um, that interaction also travels with the speed of light. Um, so not even gravity goes faster uh, than the speed of light. So if you were to like today, um, you know, erase sun from the existence somehow, I don't know, um, just like snap your fingers, call the cue, and he erases it from the, from the existence, um, it'll take eight minutes for the earth to notice uh -huh. and to, you know, start changing its behavior due to this. Um, so yeah, not even gravity can violate this, um, this law. Yeah, I've definitely heard about that in the context of light, but I'm wondering what, what does gravity have to do with the speed of light? Um, so every, you know, every uh, interaction, it, like gravitational interaction or electromagnetic interaction and so forth, operates through messengers, um, if you want to think about it that way, messenger particles, for example, um, like gravitons. Um, and so none of these guys can move faster than the speed of light. So um, it's more of a universal speed limit with mm -hmm. which any particle can move in our universe. Um, but in order for a particle to even move with that uh, at that speed, it needs to be massless. Um, so mm -hmm. photons happen to be massless, so they move with the speed of light. Um, that's the connection between the, the light and gravity. Uh, it's more of a connection to the speed of, of light, which happens to be the highest speed in our universe. I see that why? makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's a particular speed, which is like, why is it that exactly? And do you know of, of any work that has like simulated universes with different speeds of lights, even if they're only a tiny bit different? Does it just work out differently? Or is it like this universe can only work at exactly this speed? Yeah, so there, so okay, so now we're touching on something that, that people often uh, talk about in context of um, the anthropic principle. Why is our universe precisely the way it is? And the simplest, one of the simplest answers you can give to that is because we wouldn't exist if it wasn't. 
Um, I would say that most of statements like that are at this point in time based on like very hand wavy arguments and perhaps speculation um, rather than rigorous simulations that you might hear when we talk about, um, you know, how did galaxies form? We simulate that, but that we simulate in great detail. We can handle that. That's a manageable problem, manageable question. Simulating an entire universe with a different set of fundamental constants is a really difficult thing. And especially if the question you're asking is, do humans appear in that universe? Does intelligent life appear in that universe? We don't know. We can say that, you know, in universes that look dramatically different than ours, maybe the speed of light is very different, or, you know, the fine structure constant is very different. It would be very hard to build stars and then build all the elements that you need for life and then build life. Things like that we can say. And we can use that as an argument to say, well, you know, there wouldn't be us to ask this question if, if conditions weren't just right. Um, some people call this kind of like a uh, condemn this kind of approach as like, this is a lazy way out, uh, right? We haven't really understood everything and we haven't proven it. But, you know, it's a, it's a valid point of view, I think, um, in, in some sense. Yeah, I think, I think it's some type of like, there's probably a more technical term for it, but almost like hindsight bias. Like we can ask this question yeah. precisely yeah. because we were already born into this universe. <laughs> yeah, but, but just to, you know, just to emphasize once more, uh, if, if there is a possibility of a meta theory be it string theory or maybe something else we haven't yet come up with um, that would by construction tell us exactly you know the predictions for the numbers that come out for fundamental constants of nature in the universe that would be fantastic i mean this is like the end holy grail dream of, of physics we don't even know if this is possible um, at this point in time but i would say you know string theory and the surrounding mathematical framework is one of the leading ways we are trying to attack this question. And that is way outside the area of my expertise. Yeah, I think that would be a great place to close. So talking about this holy grail, like hypothetically, if we if we could explain um, anything we wanted to in the physical universe, I guess, what what would that mean? Um, let's lim we'll limit it to your field because we won't talk about like how we could have unlimited energy and colonize the galaxy and, and all these crazy things. Uh, what, what would it mean uh, for your field of cosmology specifically? What you mean, what would that discovery be or how would um, that? Change? Maybe both, maybe both. What, what would it be and what would it do for us aside from just having a more complete understanding of the universe? Yeah, um, so these kinds of questions, it's really hard to predict like what the course of um, you know history would be uh, it could be very different impact on humans depending on what we see. Um, so just to give you a sense, you know, that people sometimes joke, joke in my field that like maybe there, are, you know, dark matter, there maybe there's a whole dark matter world that uh, has all sorts of different particles, just like our own world has, you know, a whole uh, set of particles that we're dealing with. It's a really complex model of particle physics. Maybe there is a copy of that um, within what we call the dark sector. Um, meaning like this dark matter actually is a lot of different things. And maybe there's structure to it. And maybe there's, uh, you know, dark matter people out there and things like that. Um, I mean, we can, we can imagine all sorts of things. I don't think we're anywhere near to being able to probe these ideas. We have to start simple. Um, but I think it would be if we discovered, you know, uh, signatures of um, dark matter particles in cosmological experiments in the next decade, I mean, we would be thrilled. It's like the satisfaction, very childish satisfaction of like solving the puzzle. Um, yeah. I think that's the first, that's the first sentiment. And then what would that mean? It depends on what we, what we open up. It's like opening up another box full of toys, right? Um, we go further, we understand more. And sometimes those discoveries have very practical implications for our technology mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, but sometimes they're just they're just satisfying to our human nature. Yeah, you know what? In that case, a better question might be: Do you think the puzzle can ever be completely solved? So I imagine there's probably a camp of some people who will say that everything will one day be mapped out. All we need is enough information, and even if humans can't do it, it's theoretically possible. And I imagine other people might just say some things are either fundamentally probabilistic or or fundamentally unknowable forever. So, so I will touch on a topic that's a little uh, maybe controversial in my field. I think physicists often um, 
often shy away from talking about faith, uh, but I do think that most physicists who are passionate about their work uh, are true believers that it is possible to figure it out. I think we're all, all of us in this field at the very least have the religion of, we think we can do it. Um, otherwise it would be very hard to exist. I think that's a bias in a, in a selection process. Um, so yeah, I do think we can do it. Um, why do I think that? I don't know, it's on faith. I think it's on faith at this point. Yes, we could uh, slam into a wall and never be able, you know, dark matter particles are not guaranteed to ever do anything interesting. Maybe they're really boring and we can never, never, ever probe them um, the way we hope to in, in cosmology. In that case, bad luck for us, um, but we've never yet encountered the dead end in science like that. Um, so no, I don't have proof. We've just never been in a completely stuck position from which we, we cannot find out more. Um, and the reason, you know, I'll probably stop doing this job if I, if I start feeling like we've really, we're really done. Um, I don't think we will be, I don't, but that's yeah. on faith. I share that same faith. I think that's a great place to end. Thank you so much, Dr. Glusevic. This was, this was a very fun talk. Thank you, Adam.